Earlier, we saw how we could get the equation of a line in space by using vectors. We had one vector to move to a starting point, and then we had a direction vector that was scaled by a parameter t that moved us to some other location along the line. The idea of using the terminal point of a vector to plot a curve is what we're going to explore in this section. When we were graphing lines, we thought of it as walking along a straight line path at a fixed speed. But it doesn't have to be this way. For a general curve, the path we travel can go in different directions and can move at different speeds. We will still maintain the idea that for every value of t we're in a specific location, and that this location is the terminal point of some vector in standard position. In the abstract, this idea is just having each of the three coordinates being a function of t. For any given t, we have an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, and a z-coordinate. The equations for these coordinates are called parametric equations, and we would say that we have a parametrization of the curve. We can put the whole thing into a vector r, so that r of t is equal to x of t, y of t, z of t. This would give us a vector-valued function. The input is a number t, and the output is a three-dimensional vector. Alternatively, we can keep the equations separate and have parametric equations. Here are the formal definitions for these ideas. Definition. A vector-valued function is a function whose input is a real parameter t, and whose output is a vector that depends on t. The graph of a vector-valued function is the set of all terminal points of the output vectors with their initial points at the origin. Parametric equations for a curve are equations of the form x equals x of t, y equals y of t, and z equals z of t that describe the xyz coordinates of a point of a curve in R3. Notice that the set of parametric equations automatically gives us a vector-valued function, and that a vector-valued function can be turned into a set of parametric equations. When we are looking at parametric equations, it's important to recognize they have both the shape of the curve and also how we traverse the curve. Even for a curve as simple as a circle, we can have a number of different starting points, we can go in different directions, and we could go at different speeds. Activity 9.6.2 explores this idea more deeply. And in the next section, we're also going to look at the concepts of the velocity and the acceleration of a particle moving along a path given by a set of parametric equations. But for now, it's enough to know that it's not just the shape of the curve, but also how you travel along it. It is helpful to introduce parametric equations because it gives us access to a wider collection of curves than functions. You might recall using the vertical line test to determine whether a graph is a function. The idea is that we're using the x-coordinate as the input of the function, and that for each input we can only have one output. When we're using parametric equations, that is not a problem. This is because we're not using the x-coordinate as the input, but some parameter t. This also means that we can have curves that self-intersect, and this still isn't a problem. If we wanted, we could take a function of the form y equals f of x and turn it into a vector function t f of t. This is really just a different way of notating the coordinates of a position on the graph as a vector instead of as a point. As a side note, some students write x f of x instead of introducing a parameter. This is a problematic notation. The problem is that we are using the same symbol for two different things. If you look at the graph on the left, the idea becomes more clear if we actually label the axes. We can now see that x is trying to perform two different functions, and it can be confusing. In general, we try to avoid using the same symbol to represent two ideas at the same time. Traces and level curves are two examples of curves that we can convert to vector functions. Just as before, these curves can help us to understand the shape of a surface. Here's the formal definition again as a reminder. Given a function z equals f of x, y, we can get a trace by fixing one of the independent variables to be constant. Notice that if we do this, then the function z becomes a function of a single variable, which we can then convert into a vector function. And remember that if we have a vector function, we also get a set of parametric equations. Level curves are more difficult because you may have to identify the parametric equations yourself. This will take some time and practice, but the problems at this level are not too difficult. If your curve is a line or a function of a single variable, then you can use the ideas that we've already seen. The other important curve you'll need to recognize is a circle. The most common two-variable parametrization of a circle of radius a is r of t is equal to a cosine t, a sine t, for t between 0 and 2 pi. This travels once around the circle, starting from the positive x-axis and moving in the counterclockwise direction. Although this is a two-dimensional curve, it can be converted into a three-dimensional curve in several ways. For example, if we picked a fixed z value, such as k, then we would be plotting the circle of radius a at height k. 
but there's much more you can do with this. For example, the circle of radius A on the YZ plane can be obtained by setting the X coordinate to zero and picking the Y and Z coordinates to be the sine and cosine terms. If you wanted to translate the center to a different position, you could just add or subtract constants as appropriate. But these are all just adjustments to a basic picture. Again, this takes a little bit of time and practice. You shouldn't expect to understand this by just watching a quick video. You may find it helpful to play around with some online parametric graphing tools to help you get a little more intuition with this.